CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to have Winifred Bragg on the podcast with us today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about Dr. Bragg. She's quite an amazing woman. She is an expert in providing non-surgical treatment for injuries and pain resulting from spinal and orthopedic conditions. She's the CEO of the Spine and Orthopedic Pain Center in Norfolk, Virginia. She recently started Home Pro Therapy. Watch out for that startup. It's going to be coming up real fast. It's a digital platform that integrates physical therapy, pain management, psychological services to provide coordinated, coordinated care for persons suffering from chronic pain and those needing comprehensive rehabilitation. She is a nationally recognized speaker. Dr. Bragg has been featured on ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. She's been quoted as an expert in Red Book, Woman's World, and Self Magazine. She is the best-selling author of a book, Knockout Pain, Secrets to Maintaining a Healthy Back. And by the way, that is a fantastic book. I read it myself, and we all need help with our back sometimes. Trust me. I was, I was doing deadlifts today earlier and thinking about you, Dr. Bragg. Oh, wow. <laughs> Dr. Bragg is the creator of the Bragg Factor, which we're going to talk about today. I'm really excited about that. It's a system to propel your personal and professional life. She utilizes the Bragg Factor to teach entrepreneurs and other professionals on how to own their value and the critical business skill of self-promotion. We all need some of that. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Alabama, her medical degree degree is from um, Meharry Medical College, and she completed an internship at the Baptist Medical Centers in Birmingham. She frequently speaks on strategies to help entrepreneurs advance in a competitive job market. Dr. Bragg has presented programs and workshops at several universities and Fortune 500 companies. And Dr. Bragg is an amazing woman, and I'm just thrilled to have you on the podcast today. So I just wanted to start with a question for you, Dr. Bragg. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of how did you get to where you are today? Thanks, Ms. Mary. I'm excited about being here today as well. Well, you know, in order to get where I am today, it was just a journey. I started off as a student at the University of Alabama, majoring in microbiology. And from there, I went to medical school at Meharry Medical College, as you said. And then I did my training at the University of Michigan. But while in medical school, I was fortunate to have a good mentor. Mentors are very important and coaches are very important for success in life. And my mentor taught me that not only did I need to be a good doctor, but that a good doctor could have major impact on a community and be an influencer. And that's why I was able to start my own business and speak and do other things because he took me by the hand and showed me that a doctor wants to be someone that has uh, some influence on economic empowerment. Wow, that's amazing. That's a, a great mentor to have had. Yes. And it sounds like a, a long life lesson in that. Lifelong lesson. He's retired now and I still talk to him from time to time and he still gives me little nuggets of wisdom. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So, so how, did he ever, ever have any influence on the brag factor? Tell us about the brag factor. Well, the brag factor probably was born when I was at the University of Alabama well before I knew that there was a brag factor. Okay. What happened, I found myself in a class of three or 400 students, and the teacher loved to call on me, and he would ask me questions, and I didn't know the answer. And I was intimidated uh, in front of all of those students and embarrassed and didn't know what to do. So I told my parents, I'm like, college is not working out for me. What are we going to do? Oh, my gosh. And my parents <laughs> said, well, in order to reach your goal, it has to work out for you. And so... He said, you must turn it around and make sure that you're able to pass that chemistry class because you need it. And so what I decided that I was going to do is put it in my own hands. And when he asked me something, he might ask me something on page 50. And I would know page 51, 52, but he would ask me on page 50. I had to learn how to say it in a way that everyone in that room knew that I wasn't a dummy, that I knew the other information surrounding what he asked me even if I didn't know the specific answer. And when I did that with confidence, he stopped asking me certain things. And so I think that's when the brag factor was born because I had to learn how to own my own value. And that's what brag factor does. From that experience, I teach people the importance of owning their value. I knew chemistry. I was a, on a student in high school. But when he came at me, I didn't know. And we all find ourselves sometimes at a networking event or uh, at a meeting 
where sometimes someone calls upon you and you just can't find the words. What do you need to say? So Brad Factor says to you, what's unique about you, Rosemary? What are three unique things about you that you've done that no one else has done? And you could package it in a 30 second phrase that people will remember you as you network through a room. And that's what Brad Factor teaches you, how to own your value. And what I found out, Rosemary, is that people don't like to brag. People see bragging as a negative thing, but bragging really just tells about your value proposition. Why does someone think one startup is better than the other? Why would you be best for a job? I tell people everyone needs a brag book so that they can put stories in there that separates them from someone else. And so that's what Brag Factor does. It's a five-step system that teaches you how to own your value. Because particularly with women, studies have shown that if there is a job, Rosemary, with 10 qualifications, a man will apply if he has one qualification and a woman will, won't apply if she lacks one. And so it's about confidence and being able to say, I'm good enough to do it. So um, how do you figure out what the value is? You know, how does one dig inside themselves and, and identify their differentiating value propositions? Well, sometimes it may be from some of your friends. If you would ask your friends, say, what have you noted about me that you think is really good? What do I bring to this relationship? People you work with that are honest with you and tell you what you bring to their relationship that they found is meaningful. What do people always seek you out for? And I found about that when I was in medical school and when I would present patients, my other colleagues would say, wow, how did you present it like that? And it was so succinct. So I realized that presentation and speaking was something that was unique about me. And people will tell you as you go through life, what do you keep hearing people say that's unique and good about you? And that's how you kind of package it. And then you learn how to package it with power words so that people understand what's unique and good about you. You are an amazing speaker. I, I'll never forget that, that pitch you gave at, um, in Virginia Beach. You know, when you were a winner up there with your new startup, uh, you are so eloquent and everyone in the room uh, clapped. It was just uh, incredible. You, you, you certainly have it. H how should startups use the brag factor? And I, I have to tell you, I, I really can um, relate to that going into this large conference, you know, no one in the room and you have to figure out who's in the room that you need to know. Right. right. And, uh, and, you know, so how do startups use this brag factor? Um, it, let's say in a, in a conference setting or wh whatever setting you think is most appropriate. Well, you know, I'm a pain doctor. And one thing I've learned as a pain doctor, I study pain, but physical pain, emotional pain, career pain, setback pain, all pain sort of has some similar characteristics. And you're right. Believe it as much, uh, or not, as much as I talk, I used to hate networking. I would go to a party and they'd say, hi, Dr. Bragg, I'm Dr. Bragg. And then the people say nothing. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> and say, hi, I'm Dr. Bragg. And they just say, okay. And then I'm like, what, what am I supposed to say? So what I had to learn in order to be successful startups or in your career, when you find yourself that one lonely person in a cocktail party, a networking, a conference, where there are three or 400 people, you need to have rehearsed and worked with somebody to kind of coach you to say those three unique things that are unique about you. So if I'm going to doctors, I have a certain thing that I may say, I'm Dr. Bragg, but when I'm speaking to authors or to startups, I have a different brag factor that I talk about. So I tell people, you need a bag of different 30 second brags about you that fits the situation. So entrepreneurs need to know what would be different about their company that someone would remember about it. If I'm with doctors or a bunch of doctors are there, I'm not gonna emphasize Dr. Bragg. I may talk about, I am Dr. Bragg, the best-selling author of Knockout Pain, Secrets to Maintain a Healthy Back. That's gonna make me stand out. If I'm at a group with entrepreneurs, I'm gonna talk about my startup, home pro-therapy and how it coordinates therapy, pain management and psychological therapies for people with chronic pain. And so you wanna get it and look in front of the mirror and say it, make it conversational so it doesn't sound so braggadocious and then practice. <laughs> Braggadocious. Braggadocious. Practice it in front of someone that would critique you and tell you, ah, did that sound too fluffy? 
or was it really conversational? Because people want to learn about you as well. And so that's what I tell people to do. And then not only, there's a course that I teach on relationship building. There are four Ps. When you go to that cocktail party, people love to talk about other people. So if you can get someone to talk about the other people in their life, mm. if you say, hey, um, for instance, you have shrimp and they're eating the shrimp. You may say, hi, how's the shrimp? And the guy says, really, I hate it. I <laughs> say, well, what is your passion? That's another P. He says pizza. So if you had to take him to a lunch or a dinner meeting to talk about business, certainly you wouldn't take him to a seafood restaurant because he already told you he likes pizza. So right. then you say, well, pizza, why pizza? Well, I have a six-year-old son who plays baseball, and he likes pizza. So you see how you get those four Ps? You get them to talk about the people, your son, and then you kind of keep this up on what I call a relationship grid. So the next time as you're growing that relationship with that person, you now know he likes pizza. You know he has a six-year-old son that plays baseball. That's going to give you a framework to build that relationship because people like to talk about themselves, and that's going to be a thing. And then pain or problems. If you can ever solve a problem for someone, if someone you talk meet in that networking uh, event says, I'm new in town and we have a new baby, maybe you know a babysitter. You see how you solve the problem yeah. for them? So there are four Ps. There are P, there are the people that are important to them, their passions, what are their um, problems that they have, and then what are the things that are priorities for them? Maybe they give money to a certain charity. So if you can kind of center it around those four Ps, I have found in life that that has helped me tremendously as I have built businesses. So, so Winifred, um, it's, that's extremely interesting. I love the four Ps. So say you are trying to get in front of somebody who is very, very difficult to get in front of. I mean, this person gets you know, 1,500 emails a day. Uh, they are taken into... 25 different directions and they're dealing with thousands of people, you know, and, and you're, you want to use your four P's, but they're far away from you. They're not, they're, maybe they're, you're in, you're in Virginia, they're in California. How do you break the ice? How, what, what's your secret to getting the door open? That's kind of like getting in front of a Rosemary Truman. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to seize the moment that whenever you get in front of her, that 20 seconds or whenever you introduce yourself to her, that 30 second brag has to be a powerful thing that tells her something you have to have studied her. It's strategic. There's nothing wrong. You're not stalking a person when you read their LinkedIn, their Facebook, <laughs> and get what I call intelligence about them. So you get intelligence about a Rosemary so that when I meet her or I have to email her, maybe I find out that she's a University of Alabama Roll Tide football fan. <laughs> Roll Tide. A lot of people meet me by that. They'll write me on LinkedIn and say, hey, Dr. Bragg, is Alabama going to have a good season this year? Well, that's something, you know, I'm very interested in that. And so sometimes you can find what's that common ground by searching LinkedIn and Facebook and just put in the subject uh, heading, hey, I know that um, USC or Boston College Looks like they're going to have a good year this year. And see, you may open their email because you said something out of line that was not what they are used to looking at. I have a guy who is a coach that tells me about marketing. Well, when Philadelphia Eagles won, I text him and said, congratulations <laughs> for the Super Bowl. Well, they hadn't won the Super Bowl in ever so many years, so he responded to me immediately. And so from that, we built a relationship because now he – compares Philadelphia Eagles, and he knows I like Alabama football, he's in the winning circle. So I said, hey, Steve, now you're in the winning circle and see how that does. That's what I do. That's wonderful. I have to tell you a funny story. So recently, uh, we're working on the SCALE project, SCALE um, Challenge. It stands for Supply Chain and Logistics Enterprises. Okay. So we, we were looking high and low for um, an organization that systematically connects artists into high-tech companies. Okay. And this group came up called uh, Codame, uh, C-O-D-A-M-E. Mm -hmm. And they, they, like, they have these festivals that connect uh, artists with high-tech companies, high-tech startups. Anyway, I wanted to get in front of the guy who runs it, and his name is Bruno Fonzi. And Bruno Fonzi is a chief engineer at Salesforce. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get in front of this guy? Because 
you know, Mark Benahoff, I, I, was, I tried to get in front of him. I haven't, haven't succeeded at that yet, but I'm working on it. Maybe you'll see this video and, and I'll, because I mentioned him. But anyway, I found out that Bruno likes chocolate coffee, ch ch chocolate and coffee. And I personally like chocolate coffee, which right. is like espresso stuff. And so I put it in my subject line, chocolate coffee. And I got, a, I got, a, I got an email back in 15 minutes, which is pretty awesome. So now we're working on a partnership with them. So it's very exciting. So what you're saying is, uh, is absolutely so critical. And, um, and, but you've, you've codified it, which is quite impressive. And uh, I think everybody on, who listens to this podcast is going to go away with um, really great lessons. And so I, I, I'm grateful for you sharing that. So you were also part of the Virginia Beach Bio Startup Challenge. You were a winner with your startup. Hi. Um, so you know, tell us a little bit about your startup and what impact do you think the Virginia Beach Bio Startup Challenge has on the local ecosystem? I think it has very positive impact on the local ecosystem because it's going to increase economic economics by bringing jobs there and anytime you bring jobs to a community you change the whole landscape of what that community does i uh, found that working in the challenge was very important but the center uh for the, of advanced innovation was very important with me in getting that startup off the ground why because i learned at an early age speed matters now, for young people listening, speeding in a car doesn't matter because you will get a speeding ticket. But for entrepreneurs, speed matters. And what the center did for me, it helps you think, sure, people say, I can Google anything. I can Google how to do a business plan. Yep, but you can Google and take 10 years before you get that plan together. And so I think by going through the challenge and working with, the, with CAI, I was able to get to point A to B much faster that I would have been able to do on my own. And that's what it does because it shows you how to do business plans, executive summaries, how to do that 20 second pitch that you talked about that I uh, was able to do. And I think that it will have tremendous impact on the local economy here in Virginia Beach because there were 20 startups with various jobs that it's gonna bring to our community. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So, you know, our model of um, the Center for Advancing Innovation, our model is kind of like a, a we're kind of like matchmakers. We take these inventions sitting on the shelf. We match them with great entrepreneurs like yourself, and then we, we match them with capital. So it's kind of like a trifecta. Um, you know, we've been doing this for, uh, you know, five years altogether. We've launched 300 companies. Um, you know, we, we of course want to continue to pr propel this forward. What do you think the next evolution is in, you know, getting these, the, or the importance of getting these inventions off the shelf is? You know, what, what is your perspective on that? Well, any time that we can move a invention fast forward, we change the market, we increase financial structure, and we bring economics to any local ecosystem that you're trying to uh, impact. And so I think by doing that, and you have the history of having done 300 companies, getting them off the shelf. You see, first of all, I see an entrepreneur or a business kind of like having a baby. You first have to, you can't birth the baby until you conceive the idea. And so we, a lot of the entrepreneurs probably come to you with an idea and they are conceiving the idea. And I see your center, CAI, and put it all that together with the infrastructure of having them to then to birth the baby. Because I had the idea, the conception of the HPT, but you helped me to bring it to life, to birth it. And that's what I think the impact is of what you're doing. You're just birthing babies, Rosemary. You're I had 300 babies. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and what you have to realize, just like any baby, sometimes when you first start walking, the baby falls down. And, but you don't tell the baby, don't walk no more, baby. You may fall right. down. Oh, yeah. That's what entrepreneurs and small business people need to know that launching a business is like a baby walking. He may fall down, but you are there to tell us, baby, keep trying again. And that's what I like about working with you in the center. Oh my gosh, you are awesome. <laughs> Fabulous. It's like, yes, you would not tell a baby to, to <laughs> don't try walking again. Try Absolutely. Walking again. Right. Jeez. Um, that, that would be a recipe for disaster. What we found also is, you know, we have great people like you, entrepreneurs like you, it, you know, the first idea might not be the, the last one that becomes a unicorn. It's uh, it might be three iterations, but when you have a dedicated, tenacious, passionate grit 
and embracing entrepreneur like you, it, it's, it's about the person and the team. You know, so the, the idea may change, it may evolve, but, but if, the, if the team, the management team is good, it will be successful. And that's what's important because like you say, your first idea, what you have to do is you may have to prune it down and horn it down and shave it. And someone like you may have to say, yes, Winifred, that may be something that you're passionate about, but what's the economic benefit of that? Or how do we make that into a business thing? How do we monetize it? And so you have the different layers with the center that helps us to do that uh, with our startups and get the capital. I knew nothing about raising capital until I worked with you. And yet that is so important to do with any startup. And so that's what the center does. It brings that whole package together, as you say, putting a team together. And it's all about a team. Excellent. Well, let's just finish off with your blog. You have an awesome blog. I encourage everyone who's listening to this podcast to, to tune in. But, but one in particular that I loved uh, was the health benefits of showing gratitude. And I would just love to have your perspective on that. You know, what are the health benefits of gratitude? Well, what health benefits uh, of gratitude are, it helps people to decrease, decrease stress. We all live in a fast-paced society. Like you say, you're getting 1,500 emails. That can be stressful. And all the deadlines that people uh, have to deal with now, things have gotten so impersonable in the world today. And so the health benefits would be decreasing stress. Studies have shown that your immune system can be improved by uh, gratitude. It lowers blood pressure, lowers uh, depression. And I tell my pain patients to keep a gratitude journal so that they are not just focusing on pain, their negative pain about what I'm not feeling and how I'm not feeling good, but switch the paradigm and think about what's good about you. You may have a good spouse, you have a good child, you have a good job, but there are other things of value that you bring. And if people could focus on what's good about them, it changes their perspective. So I tell people when you get up in the morning, take about 10 seconds and mm -hmm. brag about someone in your sphere. Maybe it's your spouse and tell them something that's really good. You think for some people it's 10 seconds is a stretch saying 10 seconds, something good about them. But I try to do that with my staff. If we have a, a, a large a number of patients to see one uh, certain days, I tell them, oh, what a good job you did with the waiting room. Oh, what a good job you did bringing these people back. Because raise your hand if your boss has said so much about you, you're tired of them bragging on you. And so that's the health benefits of gratitude, showing that you are appreciated, how you appreciate others, and what it, it focuses it from you to doing other things about giving back to the community and getting yourself focused. And that when you find that your perspective is different when you wake up with confidence, saying today is gonna to be a good day, I'm focusing on the positive rather than all the negative things that we have in the world. And particularly now in Virginia Beach with the tragedy that we yeah. have, this gratitude journal can help people in spite of all of that, what can we look at that we can build upon to make things better and have the health benefits of gratitude. Wow, that's, that's a powerful, Winifred. I, when I wake up in the morning, I write down the three things I'm grateful for. You know, wow. what are the three things I'm grateful for? Um, I like what you do, which is you also kind of think about during the day, how are you going to express that uh, wow. to, to different people? Because it doesn't take much time. It takes very, very little time uh, to say, I'm very grateful for what you've done and be very specific and say the value that is created. Wow. You know, I really, I think that's, that's amazing um, advice. And I, everyone who listens to this podcast is going to have an incredible impact on their lives because of you. So I'm, um, I'm very grateful for your time today, Winifred, and for uh, providing so many valuable insights to our listeners. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.